Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruchi Pandya, and today I'm going to be talking about the development of a carbon nanofiber electrode-based biosensor for cardiac health diagnostics. Biosensors are becoming increasingly pervasive in our lives today and have a very wide range of applications, ranging from medical diagnostics to long-term health diagnostics to environmental monitoring, biowarfare monitoring, food safety, and they form kind of a lab-on-a-chip type apparatus. Cardiac arrest is actually the leading cause of death in the world. Cardiac arrest causes about one-third of the deaths in the world, with cancer coming in second at about 25%. Current techniques for diagnosing cardiac arrest are long, they're multi-stepped, they're often insensitive, they're very invasive, they actually require an entire vial of blood, and they're, they actually also require significant infrastructure to carry out. For my biosensor prototype, I use nanotechnology as the base. Some of the benefits of nanomaterials are that they're very quick, very sensitive, minimally invasive. Actually, my biosensor prototype only requires one drop of blood for effective analyte detection, and they're very inexpensive. Also, nanoelectrodes are at the scale of the molecules, which actually results in a dramatically reduced background noise and statistical reliability. This makes nanoelectrodes ideal for detecting very small analyte concentrations. Cardiac, uh, generally when a heart goes into cardiac arrest, three main protein concentrations spike in the bloodstream. Concentrations of troponin I, myoglobin, and C-reactive protein. This video right here is that of ventricular fibrillation, um, an arrhythmia that happens in the heart generally before a cardiac arrest occurs. A, a healthy heart has troponin levels of less than 0.4 nanograms per milliliter, but concentrations of above two nanograms per milliliter can indicate heart failure. The biosensor platform that I developed is based in vertically aligned carbon nanofibers in two main configurations, which I'll discuss in greater detail in just a minute. But the, the two biosensor platforms are right here. So this is the patterned vertically aligned carbon nanofiber biosensor and the randomly grown biosensor. These chips are very small. They're actually about one centimeter square. That's the size of my thumbnail. And they require only one drop of blood for effective analyte detection. The reason why I enjoy this project so much is that it truly captures the essence of science, which is its interdisciplinary nature. Um, it actually covers fields of nanotechnology, biofunctionality, and electrochemistry. This device is sensitive not only for acute illness, but also for chronic cardiac illness, which gives it a very, very wide range of applications. Um, the two devices that I just mentioned are in these two configurations, the randomly grown carbon nanofibers and the patterned carbon nanofibers. The randomly grown fibers are shown here on the top left. Um, I've grown them using plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition, or PECVD, which is essentially a large tank in which I can put on a silicon wafer, shoot in ammonia and acetylene gas, with a series of heating and cooling, which will grow these fibers in about 25 minutes. And these fibers are approximately three microns in height. The second configuration is a rectangular array. So these are patterned carbon nanofibers, also vertically aligned, which are on this lithographically etched device. So each of these nine pins on this 3x3 three three device contain a rectangular array. After the fabrication of the carbon nanofibers, they were encapsulated in silicon dioxide, which essentially makes them very, very robust. Um, and after that, I polished them both chemically and mechanically to expose the tips of the carbon nanofibers for future active site binding. The device fabrication process is long and multi-step, so I'll go over it very briefly here. I used a silicon wafer as a platform, then deposited nickel and chromium. <coughs> then I uh, grew this, this, uh, pla the carbon nanofibers in P with PECVD, and this is actually the PECVD chamber right here. Um, I affectionately call it black magic. Actually, this glow right here is the plasma being shot into the chamber, growing the carbon nanofibers. After fabrication, the fibers were encapsulated in silicon dioxide and then polished chemically and mechanically um, for future active site binding. The crux of this project is really in the surface modification um, of the carbon nanofibers. And by changing the topography of the fibers, I can manipulate the device to test for a range of proteins or um, different illnesses. So in this case, I used a carbon, I started with um, the bare carbon nanofiber electrode and I soaked it in nitric acid, basically reducing the damage from the carbon nanofiber electrode tip and cleansing the device. Then I attached an EDC NHS linker solution and followed by a specific antibody. And the reason why I used a specific antibody was that when I wanted to 
to apply the actual blood sample to the biosensor device, I wanted a specific antibody antigen pair, which would basically ensure that I have a very specific detection and I know exactly what I'm detecting and there's a very low risk for false positives. The basis of the measurement of this project is in electrochemistry. So I took three main types of electrochemical measurements, CV, which is cyclic voltammetry, DPV, which is differential pulse voltammetry, and EIS, which is electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. For simplicity purposes, today I'll be showing the CV and the DPV curves. The picture here on the left is the CV curve. CV is actually a redox reaction curve. So um, on the carbon nanofiber electrodes, it forms an electron diffusion cloud, and I used an electrolyte solution, potassium ferrous cyanide, which actually transfer, transfers an electron back and forth to create this redox uh, reaction curve. The second curve is the DPV, differential pulse voltammetry curve, which actually measures current as a proxy for resistance. So ideally, with each step of the surface characterization process, I should see an increase in resistance in the carbon nanofiber device. <coughs> This experiment was conducted in two major pathways. Um, one pathway was a concentration calibration study where I actually got to um, actually determine the highest possible sensitivity that this device could detect to. So I detected, um, first proponent, the concentrations were 0 0.02 nanograms per milliliter, 0 0.2 nanograms per milliliter, and 2 nanograms per milliliter, which is, and the 0 0.02 concentration is actually 250 times more sensitive than what's generally used in medical care facilities. Similar concentrations were used for myoglobin and CRP with baseline 5. The second part of the study was a non-specific binding study. The process for fabricating the device was done in a very similar way. I started with a bare silicon wafer and I grew the carbon nanofibers using PECVD. And in this case, I attached a blocking agent. In my case, I used a 2% skim milk buffer in PBS. And what this basically does is that it covers all of the potential active binding sites on my carbon nanofiber device except for the antibody tip. This basically allows me to ensure for effect Active, um, active site binding. Then I tested it with a human serum, in my case CRP-free, which contains everything in blood, um, ex in everything in human serum except for the CRP antigen. These, uh, this slide shows the non-specific binding data for my experiment. The, slide, the picture here on the left shows the non-specific binding data um, for the experiment. The peak separation is about 200 millivolts, which is considered ideal. Um, there is an increase in resistance in each step of the surface characterization process, as you can see here, from the bear to the linker and the antibody to the blocking agent skim milk and finally the CRP-free serum. But there is no change in resistance in the last two steps of the surface characterization which, is, which proves that none of the extra proteins in the CRP-free serum actually bound to my antibody specific or my CRP specific antibody on the carbon nanofiber device. The second graph right here shows a similar change in resistance in each step of the process, but there is a change in resistance between the last two steps, which actually shows that, d that the blocking agent effectively blocked all of the uh, undesired active binding sites, leaving the antibody site open for my specific analyte detection. <coughs> In summary, this device was calibrated in two major ways, one with a concentration study and a calibration study, and one with a nonspecific binding study. So in conclusion, this device is extremely sensitive, very effective, very inexpensive, quite portable, um, and has a sensitivity of 250 times more sensitive than what's conventionally used in medical care facilities. It's also extremely effective in terms of sensitivity and specificity, um, which basically allows me to, to detect very specific antigens, and I can ensure that I'm not getting any false positive results. This device is also a biosensor platform in the sense that it does test for cardiac arrest, but the way it's configured, it can also test for other proteins that result, or any other illness that results in a protein spike. And it has the potential to revolutionize the in-home diagnostic market, just as the insulin test has done for the diabetes market. Also, this biosensor device allows me to test not only for acute cardiac illness, but also for, cardiac, for chronic cardiac illness, which allows me to have a very, very wide range of applications for this biosensor device. In terms of future work, I'm really excited about two major channels. Um, the picture on the left right here shows a multiplex device um, using photoresist. I intend to actually um, be able to detect multiple proteins simultaneously on the same device, which could have many applications um, on the ground. 
Also, I intend to port this biosensor device onto a paper platform. So using um, gold nanoparticles in carbon nanowire wax ink, I can actually create microfluidic channels on paper and actually print out these biosensor devices, which would be extremely cheap, very sensitive, and highly, highly effective for people all around the world. Um, I would like to acknowledge a few key people without whom this project would not have been possible. First and foremost, Dr. Jessica Caney, who's been mentoring me over the past year um, at NASA Ames Research Center. Also, I'd like to thank Ted Seifert, Rakesh Kumar, and Dr. Maya Mayapan for their continued support. Um, I would also like to instead extend a sincere thanks to the Siemens Foundation and Discovery Education for giving me this fantastic chance to present my work to all of you today. Um, and also to NASA Ames for allowing me to conduct research at the Center for Nanotechnology. And finally, to George Washington University for being such gracious hosts for this event. I'm um, also like to thank all of you um, for listening to my presentation and for um, enduring all the presentations today. So uh, thank you very much.